start with the session now yeah so we start with the uh, presentations uh, first is uh, the first paper is uh, the presenting author is arundhati pande is she here dr arundhati pande no she isn't here we move now yeah we move, move on to the second presenter and second presenter is dr salil mandal okay fine anvesham yeah. maitra chief author is salil but presenter is anvesham and i'll request subsequent two presenters to be ready with their presenter presentations so that we will not waste any time Good morning, uh, respected judges and dear colleagues. I am Dr. Anisha Moitra. The topic of my uh, free paper is novel silicon plate versus auricular cartilage in upper eyelid reconstruction replacing a tarsal plate. I have no pertinent conflicts of interest to disclose. Now, resection of tumors, trauma, or congenital anomalies leave large eyelid defects. The conventional cutler beer procedure was a major advancement in the repair of. Audible person, please help. Yeah. it has come now it has come yeah you can start uh, upper eyelid entropy on ectropy on lid shrinkage were major complications with the conventional procedure uh, now we have done a modified cutler beer procedure which compares surgical outcomes functionality cosmesis of silicon plate with auricular cartilage as a tarsal plate substitute in upper eyelid reconstruction the aims and objectives of my study was to evaluate the surgical outcomes and efficacy of silicon plate versus auricular cartilage for replacement of tarsal plate in 70 to 100% lid defects to evaluate the cost and safety of using silicon plate and auricular cartilage and to evaluate the functional and cosmetic outcomes a prospective comparative interventional study over 18 months was conducted on two groups of 20 patients each uh, consisting of the auricular uh, autogenous auricular cartilage group and the silicon plate group Now inclusion criteria involved all malignant upper eyelid tumors with created defects of 70 to 100 percent, and exclusion mm, uh, criteria just involved. Just a sec, audiovisual person, please hide this thing. No, it's okay. It's obstructing here in this screen. See this timer. Involved. Shall I continue? Yes. Please. Okay, you continue. Uh, exclusion criteria included involvement of local lymph nodes, distant metastasis, and associated lower eyelid involvement, corneal infiltration, and intra intraorbital Fine. extension. Pre-operative evaluation included uh, measurement of the marginal reflex distance one, LPS action, palpable fissure height, percentage of lid involvement by the tumor, and pre-operative confirmation of diagnosis by FNAC and incision biopsy was done. Now these are the specifications of, of the silicon plate that I've used. Surgical procedure included: uh, firstly, uh, the auricular cartilage was fashioned from the uh, post-auricular region, and the silicon plate was fashioned from a 279 scleral buckle. After fashioning of the auricular cartilage and the silicon plate, a full thickness rectangular defect was created in the upper eyelid, and the remnant of the upper eyelid was divided into the anterior and the posterior lamella. Similarly, the lower eyelid was also divided into anterior and posterior lamella. The posterior lamella bay was created, and upon which the tarsal plate was embedded. The tarsal substrate was embedded, and uh, the two anterior lamella were joined, uh, and the stage one cutler beer procedure was concluded. the stage 2 involved division of the advancement flap and reformation of the margin of the upper eyelid by a 60 vitreal suture these are some of the post operative pictures now post operative evaluation included standard post operative visits at one week one month and six months lps action mrd1 pfh and central lid thickness were measured lid contour lid closure cornea were assessed at each visit histopathology and post operative mri were done now uh, post operative mrd1 and lps action was assessed at uh, the first week first month and six months for the first two visits the difference in the two groups were significant which at the end of six months became insignificant similarly with post operative palpable fissure height and lid thickness at the end of first month and uh, first uh, first week and first month the difference in the two groups were significant and at the end of six months it became insignificant The, for the silicon plate group, the lid contour was found to be maintained in a larger number of patients, and the average operating time for uh, with modified cutler beer procedure with silicon plate was much uh, less than that with the autogenous auricular cartilage group. 
these are some of the post operative pictures with uh, autogenous auricular cartilage and silicon plate now tarsal substitutes were previously uh, that were previously used involved a second surgical site or a cadaveric donor this increases the chances of surgical site infection and disease transmission although mrd1 lps action and pfh and lid thickness were comparable in the two groups uh, autogenous auricular cartilage procedure was more time consuming and involved a second surgical site there was uh, required more skill it required uh, it had complications of cartilage perforation and breakage and uh, the post operative picture had a irregular lid thickness uh, corneal complications were not noted in any of the patients and there was increased um, with uh, synthetic tarsal substitutes like metpor and tarsis there were issues of cost and availability uh, silicon plate on the other hand has low cost and therefore it is more widely available to lower socio economic populations in conclusion the silicon plate is a low cost inert thin lightweight tissue and time tested material with a smooth surface and an intrinsic curvature uh, although both silicon plate and autogenous auricular cartilage had fun uh, satisfactory functional and cosmetic results uh, the silicon plate helped maintain the eyelid architecture and margin contour better than the autogenous auricular cartilage and hence silicon plate is reckoned to become the next generation material of choice as tarsal substitute these are some of my references thank you well thank you dr arundhati it was a nice presentation mm -hmm. we have got few questions for you yes sir. one is that you have taken only those cases where cutler beard procedures were done yes sir okay so in cutler beard procedure and your end point of uh, your study was the lid height and the contour uh, correct the mrd1 mrd1 palpebral fissure height uh, lps action and uh, lid thickness so i think none of these except thickness part is addressed by the tarsus plate substitution because lid height is not imparted by the tarsus plate per se in cutler beard at least because it's a complete flap which gives rise to anterior lamina and some amount of posterior lamina also so lid height is primarily imparted by the flap not by the tarsus tarsus gives you strength in the lid it gives rigidity to the lid so that there is no entropion and there is proper uh, structure of the lid so i think your end point of a study uh, does not address to the your aim to your aim of study one secondly you have taken silicon by a buckle by from by band from a buckle. so it itself has a contour. contour so there are flat silicon plates which are available in the market so you could have taken those also and uh, we have prepared the silicon plate at our institution from the buckle we have so but the i don't think you will be able to negate that factory made contour whatever you do that uh, the contour which is imparted by the machine i don't think you will be able to flatten it completely so we did not intend to flatten it we wanted to utilize the curvature of the uh, scleral buckle okay why so because uh, the scleral buckle the intrinsic curvature of the scleral buckle it uh, imparts the contour and the curve it, it helps in the contour and the curvature of the lid okay you feel it will help yes sir, we felt that, that contour will that help that's why we use the scleral buckle mm -hmm. okay any other questions what is the uh, duration of the study uh, ma'am we conducted the study over a period of 18 months and around 30 patients at uh, 40 patients 20 in each group okay. all tumors and all cutler beards Yes, ma'am. All upper eyelid tumors, malignant tumors, and all the patients undergone uh, modified cutler beard procedure. Okay. All right. Then we can move forward now. Our subsequent presenter is uh, Dr. Abhishek. Is he here? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So my topic is TRAM, that is transcutaneous retrobulbar amphotericin B injection as an eye saver in post-COVID-19 uh, rhinoorbital cerebral mucormycosis cases. So uh, rhinoorbital mucormycosis is rapidly progressive in the absence of treatment and has a high mortality. And currently for orbital involvement, uh, excentration is only the uh, available treatment in the cases which have no light perception. And that is done to uh, limit their intracranial extension. And other orbital uh, modalities are limited. 
So excentration is not a viable option in eyes which have useful vision or limited orbital involvement and it also causes extensive disfigurement and psychological trauma to the patient. So in such cases we evaluated whether uh, retrobulbar amphotericin B can be a useful alternative as there are a limited number of studies in this area. So our aim was to assess the outcomes of TRAM injection in ROCM cases as an adjuvant to systemic standard systemic antifungal therapy. So it was a prospective interventional study and the inclusion criteria was all the ROCM cases with stage 3B or more uh, whether clinically or on radiological orbital involvement. The no PL eyes and uh, the eyes which have received any treatment were excluded and all the patients received uh, TRAM injection for 7 consecutive days and the clinical and radiological parameters and uh, demographic and systemic status were noted. The patients were followed up for 3 months. So there were 44 eyes of 42 patients and 2 patients had bilateral involvement. All the patients received uh, intravenous amphotericin as the primary treatment. And all the patients underwent surgical debridement, uh, including thes, uh, mixolectomy, and endonasal debridement. So the mean age was around 52 years, and there was slight male preponderance of two, uh, 2.1 ratio 1. Uh, systemically, uh, the, there was wide prevalence of diabetes, and as around 70% had diabetes mellitus. Uh, 50% received some form of steroids and uh, oxygen was uh, given in around 52% of the patients and 47% were RT-PCR positive for COVID. Uh, as uh, diabetes was more prevalent, similarly the mean HbA1c levels were also very high and the other uh, markers of inflammation, D-dimer and uh, serum ferritin were also above the normal range. Now coming to the staging of the uh, patients, uh, about 50% had uh, stage 3B in which one or uh, more quadrants of the eye are involved and 30% were around 3C and rest of the stages are around 4 to 8%. So these are just few of the pictures uh, showing proptosis and uh, edema and chemosis. Uh, in visual equity, uh, mostly all the patients were having a fairly good visual equity, around 80% had uh, between 612 to 66 and less than 60 was around 15%. Proptosis, uh, proptosis was present in around 13% patients and the uh, limitation of extraocular movements was present in around 34% of the patients. Uh, coming to the treatment outcomes, uh, this was uh, radiologically. Uh, there was around 52% showed some improvement on CT or MRI and uh, the patients which don't, uh, didn't show any change or there was a very uh, mild improvement uh, were taken as stable. There were around 38% and 9% uh, uh, showed worsening uh, despite giving the injections. So this is an image uh, pre and post tram. So in the upper uh, image we can see there is involvement at the orbital apex and the medial rectus is involved. And uh, so this is uh, and in the second image this is after one month. Uh, there is a resolution of the disease and the crowding is resolved and uh, there is also uh, thickening is also reduced of the medial rectus. The other outcomes involve the uh, improvement in the extraocular movements. So around 30% patients showed improvement in the extraocular movements and uh, uh, some patients around 9% required RAM augmentation and a second cycle of seven days was again given when there was a worsening on the radiology. And there was a mortality in around 11% patients. And a be better thing was the no patient required excentration in the patients receiving tram injection. So coming to the complications, subconjunctival hemorrhage was a common complication, but it was still less at around 13%. And 9% patients experienced temporary vision loss. So this is an image of a post-RAM complication. So the patient there was a proptosis and chemosis and uh, decrease in the vision after TRAM injection. And, but it was a, a temporary and self-limiting and the injection was stopped. And after five days we can see there was improvement in the movements also and vision also improved subsequently. So to <laughs> conclude, TRAM can be considered as an adjuvant to standard systemic antifungal therapy. And, uh, so it not only uh, reduces the disease progression, but can also be uh, used to preserve globe and site. 
and the main thing is that potential excentrations can be avoided. Thank you. That was a good presentation. I want to ask what was the criteria of using tram, like in which, uh, how did you decide exactly which cases you need in to give In stages tram? 3B or more, in which there more than one quadrant of orbit was involved uh, on radiologically and as well as clinically also. So that was that the only thing? What uh, about vision? No, even if the vision was good, but uh, the, the more than two quadrants were involved, then we had given the injection. And what kind of uh, amphotericin was used? This was liposomal amphotericin B, yeah. and it was uh, reconstituted with uh, distilled water, and 3.5 mg per ml we have given. Uh, okay, so you said uh, no uh, patient uh, underwent excentration in whichever you gave tram. Yes, it didn't progress uh, to to excentration. Okay. This is not switching on. So, okay, the light was not on. Okay, thank you. So, I wanted to ask: uh, after how many days you assessed for radiological improvement? You have said around 52% had radiological yes, improvement. So, the serial scan was done after one week of the injection, and every week till the patient. Was so, the pictures which you have shown is one week apart. This only? one is in one month. So, the improvement we that we saw in the patients that was at least a month. We can see. So only after one month. And also. what was the time period when you thought that we'll give another cycle of seven shots? No, if there was a worsening on the radiologically, on the CT or MRI, the disease was progressing, then we gave another shot. Actually, after giving tram, there is already so much inflammation, and because of the drug also. No, we waited for at least two to th uh, three weeks, because uh, uh, simultaneously debridement is also undergoing. Uh, the patient is also undergoing debridement, and uh, so for that also we waited for at least three weeks. And it was not like that we have given injection and next there was a worsening. So uh, like three or four weeks on after that only we gave uh, another shot of time. No patient was given less than one month repeat injection. Okay. Have you been doing any uh, debridement like with tram? So that was done by the ENT department. Orbital, orbital debridement? No, no. Nothing? They, they only do the... So either tram or excentration, that is what you mean? Yes, sir. Uh, it's a nice presentation and it is in line with most other studies, but there are a uh, few other points which needs clarification. One is that you said uh, in 9% of the cases they require some augmentation. What yes. do you mean by that? That, uh, sir, repeat cycle of tram for... Uh, so only 9% of the cases required that. That's yes. something it very... It means that there was worsening in them. So in the, uh, that's pretty unusual, actually. Most mm -hmm. other studies there in them, we also gave tram in, uh, like in most patients, they require more than three, pa three cycles of injection. The other thing is waiting for one month in mucormycosis and then deciding about progression is also a too long a period. Generally, repeat tramps are uh, given not more than one week uh, apart mm -hmm. because uh, one month a time will, I don't no, think. Not waiting for one month, like uh, scan was done after every one week. And if it is stable or it is not showing worsening, then we withhold that. Okay, so this is a little week. unusual and not in line with other studies that one single shot of tram will give you uh, so much uh, like. No, sir, for seven consecutive days. Each cycle was for seven consecutive days. Okay, okay. So you mean to say one cycle was given was for seven for days? Seven yes. Daily days. we were giving. Uh, Daily you days. were giving it for seven days, and then you waited for some time. Have All you, in some cases, uh, like withdrawn or uh, like uh, do injection diya or iske baad nahi denge? Is that what decide kiya tha? Any no, criteria? No, we followed for seven. Days. So even so if, if the inflammation, like some complication or like in that a temporary vision loss some some reaction. In that cases, we withhold it. Or if the patient is on anticoagulants, in those also we were not giving. All right. So generally, uh, the general trend was that patient never followed a set course as it was there in your study. Generally, like no, there the were all varied the patients were admitted patients. So 
we were following mostly a patient required excentration also in all the settings few of the patients they required excentration some of them so usually sir those right. are pl negative cases uh, they go for under uh, excentration that we have excluded okay earlier. okay yes. fine good thank you so we call the next presenter now and she is dr sindhu ja If your presentation is not ready, then we can call the subsequent present. Okay, all right. Audio visual people just check about it. Meanwhile, we can call the next speaker, and uh, Dr. Sahi Lagrawal, is he here? No. Dr. Sahi. And Dr. Namita Kumari. it will take care about it don't worry yeah yeah it is done you can reset the no, timer no it is already done she has done it okay yeah okay we start with your presenter assessment of the risk of obstructive sleep apnea with the activity of thyroid eye disease no financial estate as we all know that thyroid eye disease is autoimmune disorder which presented mainly with the proptosis chemosis the eyelid detraction and also the restrictive myopathy and inflammatory signs and rarely with the optic neuropathy and the corneal ulceration obstructive sleep uh, apnea is also a common disorder that is characterized by the repetitive narrowing and collapse of the pharyngeal airway and this is associated with the comorbidity increasing excessive day time sleepness and increased risk of cardiovascular disease so the both shares a very common pathophysiology so we all are aware of this uh, very complex kind of the pathophysiology in the thyroid eye disease that lead to the auto antibody activi uh, activation of the orbital fibroblast uh, with the uh, cytokine upregulation and lead to the increased volume of that uh, orbit by leading to the uh, uh, proptosis, diplopia and the restrictive uh, diseases. So interequine system is uh, uh, the most important cytokine that also enha enhances the adipogenesis. So coming to the, uh, that is a Habib et al has a one uh, a study that in the retrospective observational study has shown the association of the risk of obstructive sleep apnea and thyroid eye disease compressive optic neuropathy. And recently the Godfrey et al in the prospective cohort study of 85 patient has shown association of the high risk obstructive sleep apnea with the severity of thyroid eye disease using the stop bank survey. So the aim of this our study is to uh, evaluate the association between the obstructive sleep apnea and the thyroid eye disease activity using a stop bank survey. A stop bank survey is a questionnaire. So the study design of this study is basically is the multicentric uh, study with the prospective case controller study. The all patients were taken uh, from the duration of the January 2020 and December to, uh, 2021. In the case groups, 100 patients were included and in control group, 116 patients were included. So the in case group, the all newly diagnosed patients of the thyroid have been taken and in the control group, the age, gender, match patient not having any sign and symptoms of thyroid eye disease have taken. So in the uh, thyroid eye disease patient, we have done the, all the thyroid uh, eye workup according to the BJA classification system. And in the control group, we have done the normal uh, ophthalmological examination. And the both have underwent to the OSA uh, scoring using that uh, stop bank survey. And then uh, high risk of OSA considered when the score is more than and equal to three and in the low risk when the less than three. So analysis the, for the both groups, we have done the parametric and non-parametric test for using the chi-square test and t-test and man whitney test. And the further information, inflammation score and activity and severity is compared within the case group. 
So this is the stop band thermo, uh, question con consists of the eight question based on the snoring tiredness of an observed choking blood pressure uh, body index has more than 35 is more than uh, 50 years and neck circumference more than 40 and gender. So it has high sensitivity and specificity and considered to be a good questionnaire for the OSA skin. So coming to the result in our study, uh, the mean age is uh, like comparable in the both age group. The gender is also comparable in the both age group. The hypertension and diabetes also we don't found any significant difference in the both group. Although in the coming to the OSA, when the case there is a, in the high risk patient, the 61 patient in a high risk category and in the control is the 39. So it is coming to the significant. And also there is an important history of the smoking exposure that is more in the case. And it, uh, in the control is the sixth. So it's also coming significant. So this is the uh, significant difference in the both age group, uh, both groups noted for the OSA scoring. So this is, uh, OSA score so significant it's associated with the thyroid activity on man bitney test. However, with thyroid severity, it has shown some association, but all the more than 5% uh, percentage. So inflammatory uh, scores on visa so significant association with OSA group and uh, this table uh, demonstrate that. So coming to the discussion, this uh, study demonstrate that the prevalence of OSA is significantly higher in the patient with the thyroid eye disease compared to those without thyroid eye disease and also had the significant association. So Godfrey et al has shown that this is the OSA patient is associated with the development and increased maximum severity of the clinical features like the thyroid compressive optic neuropathy, vertical stabismus, diplopia, conjunctiva redness, chemosis, upper and lower eyelid edema and eyelid edema by using regression analysis. However, B could not identify any clinical features associated that uh, significant. So at present, we know that this is, uh, we all know that the smoking is the only modifiable risk factor and it can, OSA can be another modifiable uh, risk factors. So, there are some uh, studies in which the role of OSA treatment has highlighted the preventing the progression of vision TTA condition like the NAIN and the diabetic retinopathy. And it's a uh, stop bang uh, question is also a val already validated. S so limitation of this uh, study is there is a small sample size, multi study that can lead to the subjective bias while doing the assessment of the clinical feature. And significant difference on the smoking exposure in the case and control group can be a possible confounding factor because we all know that case smoking also affect the uh, OSA. So conclusion is that OSA has a significant association with the activity and inflammatory scores of the thyroid eye disease. Further study and impact of the thyroid eye disease should be done based on the polysomnography test. And also we should study the effect of the treatment of uh, uh, OSA on the course of the thyroid eye disease. And all th I personally feel that after this study that all thyroid study patients should be universally screened for the OSA. Thank you. That's a good uh, subject. Uh, but I think smoking should have been considered. So ma'am, that is actually a limitation oh. because when they do the case control, we can't match everything like, so actually that That's is That's the uh, major confounding factor, yeah, I yes, think. Yes. But okay. ma'am, that uh, when we did the analysis in the our case group, so that shown the OSA score with the activity and the severity significant. So that, that where confronting does not come. Okay. Uh, Another question is that uh, you have taken all the newly diagnosed cases of thyroid yes, eye disease yes, yes, and yes. what what was the stage mean stage of those cases? Like uh, they were in which stage? Sir, maximum cases were like I will say in the mild. Uh, so you, I think that has got some relation, no? Because in other studies also they have taken severe cases of thyroid eye disease. So, but sir, only because there only two disease have. Uh, two studies have been I done know, on this. I case. know, but yes. definitely that will have some implication. Yes, sir, a so mild case and a severe case, yeah. they cannot go together. So, but sir, we could not find the, for the compressive optic neuropathy and the OSA score, we could not find that association in no, with our sample size. But uh, you have not dis uh, compared that also, no? Ne severe compared, cases sir. and mild cases and... Compared, you, have, sir. you have taken those things in yes. your account? Yes, sir. With all the clinical features that thyroid compressive optoneuropathy compared, but we could not found that association like the Habib et al has found. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, have you taken in account hypothyroid and hyperthyroid patients? Yes, sir. You all, all the uh, uh, blood, uh, like you, all you thyroid, hypothyroid, hypothyroid. So any relation of OSA? Sir, we could not find. But no, you significant. 
you have not uh, discussed that in your parameters no? yes sir because in hypothyroid patients we so we sir, think that there may be more chances of osa because rather, of that, yeah yes, because yes. of more parasympathetic drive yes sir but in hyperthyroid patients we think that chances of osa may be little lesser because of sympathetic drive yes sir absolutely so right, i think sir. those are the important factors that which you could have taken yes, in yes. your study thank you sir all right so uh, now i think dr sinduja are you ready Uh, so my topic is about efficacy of intralesional bleomycin in treatment of uh, orbital lymphangiomas so as we know lymphangioma it's a benign hematomatous lymphatic tumor so it's mainly because of the proliferation of anomalous dilated lymphatic vessels which is lined by normal endothelial cells so it was initially considered as a neoplasm but the uh, issva classified it as a combined vascular malformations so it contributes 0.3 to 4% of orbital tumors and more of female predominance is seen so surgical excision is the main stay of treatment but due to the extensive infiltrative nature of this disease complete excision is not possible and it can also cause damage to the adjacent vital structures and if it's not removed completely recurrence is also very common therefore non surgical methods such as intralesional sclerosing agents have been tried So in our study we are going to see in 16 patients diagnosed with orbital lymphangiomas. So uh, all the patients were diagnosed clinically and radiologically were included. All of them went underwent detailed ophthalmological examination. MRI was done for all the patient. Systemic evaluation with along with blood investigations was done. Serial photos were taken and documented for during the course of treatment and follow up. So the exclusion was hypersensitivity to bleomycin. impaired renal function test pulmonary problems pregnant and lactating women and patients who lost to follow up so bleomycin comes in a 15 international unit dried powder one international unit of bleomycin equals 1 mg of uh, bleomycin the ideal dose is 0.5 international units per kg body weight maximum it should not exceed 15 um, sorry 5 international units per kg body weight so it is prepared in normal saline and along with 2% lignocaine in ratio 1 is to 1 so lignocaine it reduces the discomfort post operatively it also facilitates the dispersion of the drug making the cell more permeable so the volume which is injected into the lesion is usually 20% of the aspirate and it should not exceed 5 ml at per session so uh, for children it was given under general anesthesia and uh, the reconstituted solution is injected intralesionally with a 23 gauge needle with 10 cc syringe and for deep lesions ultrasound guided was done Uh, so the needle is kept in the same position and bleomycin was injected so larger amount of uh, volume if it's injected it can cause extravasation of the drug poor dispersion and even compressive effect so repeat injections were given at 2 uh, 4 weeks and treatment was discontinued after the maximum cumulative dose or after 3 to 4 injection or when no further sign was not or uh, resolution was noted clinically and mri for all the patients were done after 6 months and patients were at follow up for up to even a year of treatment so from our results out of the 16 10 were females and 6 were males five were under the pediatric age group and all the patients had unilateral presentation proptosis was the most common uh, symptom followed by lid swelling so the number of injections ranged from 2 to 4 eight patients that is 50% had complete resolution with two injections whereas three patients required four for a good satisfactory outcome two patients had uh, resolution after three injections but had recurrence after six months and three patients even after giving the maximum number of dose there was uh, no improvement hence surgical excision was done so in the uh, in our study not much complications were noted uh, there was no long term or uh, systemic side effects so these are few uh, patients as you can see there's an upper lid swelling and post two sitting of bleomycin injection there's complete resolution this is another patient with lower lid swelling uh, complete resolution is noted after two sittings this child presented with proptosis and after four sittings there was complete resolution which was even confirmed radiologically and this boy had a diffuse swelling in the upper lid and after two injection there is reduction and after four there is complete resolution 
So this man, even after the cumulative dose, there was no resolution, hence surgical excision was done. So I'll rush through the discussion. As we know, in lymphangiomas, it's mainly failure of the lymphatic to connect to the venous system. So it usually remains silent clinically and it uh, enlarges very slowly. It causes proptosis, EOM restriction, and sometimes even compressive optic neuropathy because of the intralesional hemorrhage. In MRI, we can see the pathognomic fluid levels. So to differentiate it from hemangioma or AV malformation, there is absence of flow void or even feeder vessels. So bleomycin was first used as an anti-neoplastic antibiotic. So it causes uh, breaks in the single or double-stranded DNA. It inhibits the synthesis. It induces tumor necrosis factor and apoptosis. It was first used in 1977. So these are the si adverse effects of bleomycin. Pulmonary fibrosis is very dose dependent and it happens only when the cumulative dose exceeds 400 uh, mg. So these, these are the multiple studies which showed very good results with uh, bleomycin. Raichura et al. Uh, reported a dramatic response in 13 patients with orbital lymphangioma. So in our study also around 11 patients had a very uh, complete resolution and only three had uh, recurrence and three there was no uh, improvement which required surgery. So the conclusion, intralesional bleomycin is a very effective and a safe method of treatment for orbital lymphangioma without any significant ophthalmic or systemic side effects. So it's a good alternative to surgical excision where you cannot remove the entire mass as well and when the patient is also concerned cosme for cosmesis. So it can even be used as an urgent uh, surgical um, therapy to uh, surgical debulking. So these are my references. Thank you. Uh, well, Dr. Sandhuja, your title is that efficacy of intralesional biomycin in treatment of orbital lymphangiomas. The pictures which you showed, five or four patients, out of them only one patient had orbital lymphangioma. Rest of them, they had periocular lymphangioma, which was not classically orbital. That was either in upper lid or in lower lid or in palpable conjunctiva or pernicial conjunctiva. So we are worried for orbital, real, true orbital lymphangiomas. What is the concern like giving bleomycin in true orbital lymphangiomas? Mainly compressive effects can happen or even damage to the adjacent because it's a, only for deep we can use uh, ultrasound guided but still since it's a blind procedure sometimes it can cause damage to the surrounding structures as well. Surrounding structure means? Um, any in uh, the important vitals, the nerves, is, neurovascular you, bundle, or even the optic nerve as how well. How do you get effect of bleomycin? What is the basic pathophysiology? Why it is effective? So it uh, mainly causes uh, the, um, the vascular endothelium. Correct. It mainly affects so the that, vascular that endothelium. That is also contributory to the side effect. Side effect. So there are vessels, important uh, vessels in the orbit, orbit and you can damage that. So that's why we are really worried for injecting bleomycin mm. or any for that matter, any sclerosing agent inside the orbit. But yes, it is a proven, well-tested methodology for periocular mm -hmm. lymphangiomas uh, and it really gives wonderful results. Okay. Any other? Thank you. The next presenter is uh, Dr. Saloni Gupta. Is she here? No. So uh, till now we have got three absentees. First is Dr. Arundhati Pandey, then Dr. Sahil Agarwal, and now Dr. Saloni Gupta. Okay. All right. Now we call upon Dr. Sayali Mahajan. She is here. Good morning everyone. My topic for today is hyperbaric oxygen therapy in treatment of mucormycosis, a promising therapy. No financial interest. So mucormycosis is a devastating, rapidly progressive disease seen in immunocompromised patients. In COVID-19, we had seen unscrupulous use of steroids. And in a study published in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology by Honavar et al. showed 87% were treated with corticosteroids and almost 78% were diabetics. 
Also, nasal prongs and bag and mask oxygen could be a source of infection. Treatment includes treating the predisposing factors, intravenous injection of liposomal amphotericin B, debridement surgeries, retrobulbar amphotericin B, and orbital exenterations. Mortality rate had been 70% in the 1960s. Post amphotericin B and debridement surgeries, it has come down, but it is still around 40. So we, if we see the pathogenesis, uh, angioinvasion by fungal hyphae leads to clotting response, which leads to infarction, tissue necrosis, then devastation of those tissues and invasion into the adjacent tissues. Host defense includes macrophages. They kill the swollen and active spores and inhibit germination. Phagocytes, which creates an iron restriction response, preventing further growth. But if we have systemic and local acidosis, they inhibit and interfere uh, phagocyte mobilization and function. A review by Brad Spellberg showed that simply killing rhizopus once it has already established a presence in tissue may not prevent subsequent tissue injury, perhaps in part explaining the lack of efficacy of sidal antifungal agents. So antifungals do kill fungus, but even dead fungus can cause mucormycosis. Viability of fungus is not required to cause endothelial damage and spread. Debridement procedures, of course, helps in removing this dead fungus, but in non-accessible areas, it is still causes destruction. So to circumvent these, we need to find out other treatment options and further therapy. Hyperbaric oxygen increases oxygen tension in infected and ischemic tissues. It promotes angiogenesis, decreases acidosis, improves killing by polymorphonuclear leukocyte and macrophages, allows fibroblasts to lay down collagen and new vessels, augments oxygen of amphotericin B, and a study by Carney et al. It also showed antifungal activity in vitro. The therapy involves giving 100% oxygen in a monoplace or multiplace chamber through mask, tightly fitting hoods or endotracheal tubes. 2.5 to 2.1 atmospheric absolute pressure is given uh, for a duration of about 9 to 120 minutes and patient receives around 10 to 20 sessions. So in an our study, a total of 93 patients were observed for a period of 5 months from June to October 2021. Steroids usage was seen in around 60% patients and 70 patients were diabetics. They were all staged according to staging given by Honavar and Code Mucor guidelines for diagnosis, staging, and management. So stage one comprise also if if you see the staging, 68.7% comprised of stage three and stage four. Out of those 13 patients underwent HBOT. All were diabetics. 10 had history of steroid use. All received intravenous injection of liposomal amphotericin B followed by posaconazole, debridement surgeries, and retrobulbar amphotericin B. Three underwent orbital surgery. No patient underwent craniotomy. They were also scored according to scoring given by Sharkey et al., which comprised of clinical symptoms, ophthalmological findings, and imaging. Pre-HBOT MRI scans were taken one month post-tram. Then the patient underwent HBOT. Then post-HBOT MRI scans were taken one month after the therapy. The pre- and post-HBOT mucor staging and scoring were compared. They were marked as either increase, that is rise of stage or score, decrease, that is drop in score and stage, Reduction is drop in score only, and no interval change was status quo. The mortality rates amongst the patients uh, who underwent HBOT and those who did not were also compared. These are my findings. Then if we see, 76.8% comprised of decrease and reduction in the involvement. Only one adverse event was seen. The patient had ear bleed. It resolved in two days, and he continued the therapy thereafter. These are some of the uh, cases wherein the involvement pre and post HBOT was decreased. If we see the death rates uh, out of 93 patients, 10 patients died. So uh, stage four comprised 80%, but none of the patients who received hyperbaric oxygen therapy died. If we compare only stage four, 42% who did not receive HBOT died. In previous studies, Couch et al. showed two patients with uh, cerebral abscesses marked, showing marked improvement. Ferguson showed two patients who received HBOT died, one due to pseudomonal meningitis, one due to nephrotoxicity, but four patients who did not receive the therapy died as a direct consequence of fungal infection. Similarly, Segal et al. showed 50% succumbed, but five were leukemia, one had liver transplant, and John B. et al. showed 86% survival rates. Amongst the death ones were hematological malignancies and bone marrow transplant. So most deaths in previous studies were due to predisposing factor rather than mucormycosis. In our study, the most common predisposing were diabetes and history of steroid use. Only 2% showed increase, maybe they required increase in duration of treatment or HBOT therapy itself. Conclusion, mainstay still remains injection amphotericin B, uh, aggressive debridement and orbital surgery. A hyperbaric oxygen therapy acts as an adjunct to reduce the disease load and spread. It increases the survival rate. 
For future, in acute renal patients, maybe we can see if HBOT can reduce the amphotericin B dosages and mucorials and macrophages and cytokines are a critical point for research. These are my references. Thank you. All right, it's a nice presentation. Uh, so in, the, in your study, like uh, all the established modality of treatments, they were continued yes. and this was just an added. Uh, yes. Yeah. So you really do not know whether it is actually effective or not because it's not a comparative study. Uh, okay, yes. And uh, is, is there established uh, like therapeutic effect of this particular modality in literature? It in literature, yes sir, like I showed, there were four to five studies. One was by Ferguson. What he had done was there were six patients who received uh, HBOT and uh, seven who did not. Two out of six patients who received HBOT died. One was pseudomonal meningitis and one due to enterocolitis. Mm -hmm. But four patients who did not receive died as a direct consequence of the fungal infection. Is there any other viewpoint also of HBOT, some, some uh, in literature, some side effect or concern about HBOT? Uh, concern it is only one if the patient has undergone craniotomy for uh, head uh, involvement, cerebral involvement, they may have intracranial air. So those patients are contraindicated. As well as if some patients are having a uh, pneumothorax, they are contrite, absolute contraindicated. The rest can so go ahead. So basically, like in many of the patients, some some or other type of sinus surgery has been already done. Yes. Sir. So there is a true chance of uh, air going somewhere else uh, um. uh, in these patients. So this is one concern. Then there is another theory which says that fungus itself may progress if you give too much of oxygen. So that's, this is an another viewpoint. Mm -hmm. HBOT as a treatment modality was given for many other diseases also in the past, yes, like uh, retinitis pigmentosa also, Russian school of thought and uh, uh, Cuban school of thought, they were doing this. But ultimately nothing came out. Mm -hmm. So all right, it's a good study, but you need uh, solid uh, proof for it. Okay. Right, thank you. Thank you. Definitely need more work on this. Definitely need more work on mm -hmm. this. So, Dr. Kostab Mule is the next presenter. I don't think you should. Okay. So, I think we have got record number of absentees this time. Dr. Marian Pauli. My paper is on chemotherapy as the first line treatment in patients with progressive optic glioma, a series of two cases. No financial interest. As we know, optic pathway gliomas are low grade astro astrocytic neoplasms seen in first decade of life. It can be either sporadic or associated with neurofibromatosis. Diagnosis is mainly by imaging. It is a retrospective case. It is, uh, Retrospective analysis of two cases of uh, progressive optic nerve glioma diagnosed between April 20 and February 21 in a tertiary care center in South India. Clinical features, imaging findings, and managing outcomes were analyzed. My first case is a two-year-old female child with a present with a left eye proptosis, unsteady fixation. Uh, there was RAPD, fundus showed disc edema, adduction and elevation were restricted, VP were rel was relatively normal, MRI confirmed the diagnosis, it was confined to the orbit not definite chiasmal extension. So to treat or to observe, in view of relatively normal VEP and no chiasmal extension, uh, patient was advised follow-up and uh, oncology consultation also. So two months follow-up, proptosis increased, VEP also showed changes. Uh, MRI showed a suspicious chiasmal extension. So we have decided to treat and patient was again referred to pediatric oncologist for chemotherapy. However, parents were not were reluctant to start the chemotherapy and at four months follow-up, proptosis uh, was considerably increased, VEP also became bad, and uh, child was eventually started on chemotherapy with vincristine and cisplatin. Three months after starting induction phase, the proptosis has reduced, and at 11 months after starting chemo, proptosis has considerably reduced and improvement in ocular motility was noted, but uh, uh, fundus left eye should disbalance. Last follow-up, VEP remained stable. Uh, nerve fiber layer showed changes. So this is my second case is a six-year-old female child with the right eye prominence since two years with family history of neurofibromatosis in mother. Uh, right eye best corrective visual acuity six by 12, left eye six by nine. 
uh, right eye showed proptosis and elevation restriction and there was bilateral retraction. Systemic examination showed multiple cuffy alloy spots. Fundus examination, right eye disc edema, left eye mild disc pallor. MRI confirmed uh, bilateral clioma with extension of extension with involvement of posterior thalamus, midbrain, central pons and cerebellum. Nerve fiber layer also showed changes in the left eye, right eye only very few changes. So here in this case, uh, since uh, decrease in visual acuity in both eyes uh, to observe or to treat, uh, patient was referred to oncologist because there was involvement of the brain also. But however, parents were reluctant to start. In the one month follow up, left eye visual acuity deteriorated to 6 by 12 from 6 by 9, right eye remained at 6 by 12. In, with the repeated counseling, child was started on uh, chemotherapy. And last to follow up, after completing chemotherapy, the right eye proptosis reduced, visual acuity in the both eye improved to 6 by 9, movements also improved. Fundus examination, right eye disc edema reduced, left eye disc pallor remained. Nerve, this is a serial nerve fiber layer uh, changes. Even though right eye showed a little deterioration in the beginning, then it remains stable. Left eye also remains stable. This was the HFA done at three months after starting chemotherapy. To, to summarize, we have got two cases. Uh, one, gross proptosis, uh, left eye, uh, second case, bilateral. In the right eye, um, the vision has dosally reduced and the final diagnosis, finally, optic atrophy, left eye it remained at a stable in the second case. So coming to the discussion, uh, management of op progressive optic nerve glioma is a source of controversy because of unpredictable disease course as well as concern for treatment related sequelae. So what is there in the history? Uh, we, this is a paper published in 1969 where basically uh, uh, rational for the conserva managed conservatively, but we have come long way from that. As we know, all optic nerve gliomas are not low grade. Less than 10% can be high grade tumors and it can progress. The actual biological and clinical behavior of these tumors is neither fully understood nor diagnostically predictable. Various management options are available. Either we can observe or treatment. Treatment like surgery, in disfiguring proptosis with the visual potential, radiotherapy not really recommended now. So systemic chemotherapy forms the first line of treatment in progressive gliomas. Uh, it was already described from 1985 onwards. The first line chemotherapeutic agents are vincristine and carboplatin, well tolerated. Three year and five year progression fee survival rate is 77 and 69 percent respectively. Only few side effects, carboplatin has got some allergic reactions. Uh, in 2004, SIOP, low grade glioma trial has come and the overall positive response rate is 83.7 percent, while the complete and partial response rate is 50 percent. So this is a, we have compared many studies. The recent study by Falsen et al. published in 2018 suggests pre-existing visual damage indexed by the higher rate of poor initial visual acuity uh, limits visual outcomes despite chemotherapy that highlights the importance of starting chemo at the early stage of visual deterioration. Other regimens are also available. So why chemotherapy? It is relatively safe, uh, arrest disease progression and arrest further visual deterioration. In our study, none of the patients reported any side effects, proptosis and visual acuity improved or remained stable. First case, the advanced damage occurred prior to starting chemo, leading to poor visual outcome. No long-term follow-up available. Uh, so to conclude, needs more awareness regarding the need and safety profile of systemic chemotherapy in progressive ONGs, needs close follow-up for signs and symptoms of disease progression, and start chemotherapy at the earliest sign of progression for better functional and cosmetic outcome. Thank you. How long was the follow-up? Uh, one year. After completing year. chemotherapy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, Marian, your uh, second case was a classical case of optic nerve glioma. But in yeah. first case, there was an eccentric lesion, uh -huh. not, not uh, the classical glioma like axial proptosis was there. It was abaxial proptosis. And lesion was also more like of optic nerve meningioma. It was not a fusiform enlargement of optic nerve, but it was an eccentric <laughs> enlargement of optic nerve going supranasal. So, what is your take on it? Uh, can it be a two-year-old child? Uh, no, but you can yeah. get meningioma, though it yeah. they are not yeah. common, but you can get yeah. because that is not a classical glioma presentation. You can uh, yeah. show your CT scan once again if you are having mm -hmm. it here. Yeah, yeah. 
because in glioma you don't get such picture yes. so i think uh, uh, though in meningioma also like they are difficult to operate in this particular case so giving chemotherapy is fine but just for diagnostic part i think yeah there is some yeah. doubt on it yeah so that's all right otherwise it's a nice thing thank you okay. Uh, we have got a keynote address also here, Dr. Sujata Savitri. We welcome you, Dr. Gagan, for presenting the keynote address. Uh, the topic is Epithelial to Mesenchymal Transition in Retinoblastoma Tumors for Sujata Savitri Rao Award. Welcome, sir. Thank you, Shilpa. By the time judges collate scores and everyone is keeping finger crossed, I'll just rush through my presentation. So essentially quite a repeat because this is the last year paper for this same session. I'll just uh, see lots of PGs and you know young people around. So I will change the talk a bit and probably give you the philosophy how it is done and that might be interesting and help you in planning something in future. So the title of this talk or the is Epithelial to Mesenchymal trans uh, Transition, EMT in short, in retinoblastoma tumor and we are looking at it as an intervention target. No financial disclosure, study has been done in Grow Lab and Arayan Netralia, Bangalore. So retinoblastoma, quick overview, we all know about it and we have multiple treatment modalities available and with time we keep on getting new and new things. So let's say right now we are on intra-arterial chemotherapy and after that we are waiting for something new. So even with all these things, you will realize that the prognosis can be still improved. So the moment we get something new, the prognosis become better, things become better. Why? Our interest is whenever we are planning something, not moving slides. Whenever we are planning something, there has to be a question. So, what is the question here is? Audio is interest. The question here is why, what we want to do, what do we see? So, these images, if you see on the left, are a group A retinoblastoma, you know, very easily treated, early retinoblastoma Bs and Cs with good prognosis. That's what most of the developed countries will get. What we are getting is these kind of cases and you would have seen. Extreme advanced cases, probably more of these and these for whatever reasons they are. So when we have that, our prognosis rate or our you know, response is not that good. So what can we do to improve our cohort? I don't think so. The West would have enough patients also to be looking at advanced disease so much. So India, China, these countries are where, where you have advanced disease. So we want to see if we have a uh, you know, management which will give us a better prognosis something which can be probably added upon to the existing treatment and give a better response. Also, if you look at chemotherapy, it's like a nuclear bomb. You give chemotherapy, it will work on all dividing cells and we know the mechanism. So it will work on different stages of cell cycle. So you know, it's not selective for retinoblastoma. Intra-arterial chemotherapy makes that selective by delivering it only to retinoblastoma rather than the whole body. But can we have something which will selectively work on tumor cells and doesn't affect other cells of the body, which will be better, will we avoid so many problems? and which will also reduce toxicity and will be better tolerated. And many a cases when there's a recurrence and after chemotherapies, you might still like to have certain other things which will help because the first, uh, the tumor may be chemo resistant now to the earlier chemotherapy. So understand what is EMT. So epithelial cells are tightly bonded together. So they have cell to cell adhesions, mesenchymal cell don't. So a process where epithelial cell lose those adhesions and become mobile and become behave like a mesenchymal cell or become mesenchymal is EMT. This is well known in all the cancers and what it does is, it helps in four things. It will help in T1 initiation, that is it will form a carcinoma in C2, lead to further progress and make it an invasive carcinoma. Most important, it leads to chemo resistance because the resistant cell, once it transits, may escape the chemotherapy and then again forms tumor. And also this will be causing metastasis. A mesenchymal cell is mobile, epithelial cell will be stable. So mesenchymal cells will be responsible for metastasis. So knowing this background that you know tumor have other tumors in body have EMT transition, we wanted to see whether EMT is at play in retinoblastoma or not. And then understand what is its signaling pathway because then we can intervene. If you know where it is acting and how it is acting, we can intervene somewhere. So we, take, uh, we took nine tumor samples of retinoblastoma and two pediatric controlled retina and run them through gene expression microarray. And just look at it, these are some of the genes, actually you get a long list, some important genes which are upregulated and downregulated. Uh, you can just pay attention to this ecadrenine end right now because that is a main marker for epithelial this thing and I forgot to mention here. Here, once you see this slide, 
we have epithelial markers which are onto your left and which are onto the right are mesenchymal markers. So we already know this information. All you have to do is see whether we are getting these markers or different markers in RB. And along with this marker, there could be different signaling pathways. So with this gene expression microarray, these are the sample 5-5 genes. So you are finding that there is an upregulation and downregulation of genes, which give us a clue here that EMT pathway is at play. Now, you would also remember central dogma if you go back Watson and Crick and everything. So what does central dogma say? DNA, RNA, protein, in short. So whenever you are having something in gene, it may or may not result in a protein. So you have to validate that entire cycle and see. So when you get in gene, you validate that and see whether it's acting at a protein level or not. Or similarly, find something at protein level, you have to validate it at a gene level. You may have a gene mutation, something, but it may not be affecting the disease. So going by this, this is the first step when you got the gene. And then what we do is, once we have this, you work on RB cell line. So you do a cell line experiment and see how it is happening. So when we take RB cell line and do a qPCR to check for the protein expression, this is what you get. So you get NCAD and momentin being high, which is associated with advanced tumors. We also get high FN1 SMA snail, which are associated with metastasis. And we get high BCL, XL, and AKT, which are associated with better survival and resistance to tumor. Better survival of the tumor, not patient. So all these markers are from the list which I showed you. These are all markers of EMT. So here you also get the evidence of EMT markers being there in the cell line. So the retinoblastoma tumor is also having this. And the same thing now you do in a western blot. So when western blot, if you see here, this is a darker line means the tumor is there. So interestingly, E and N, if you see, E is up, this is a darker line, N is down, this is EMT. E is epithelial, M is mesenchymal, N1. So you can again find an evidence of EMT happening with, along with other markers. Now, uh, interesting thing here would be if you look at here, TGF beta R1, R2 are absent because they are absent in the very RB1 cell model. Actual retinoblastoma has these markers. And very important thing here would be these two last pictures here. If you see beta catenin here, if you can see the cursor, very dark one here, and phospho beta catenin all there. This is a wind signaling pathway where this mediates through vimentin and twist. So this is the pathology marker that you have EMT and you know through ZEB1, is a hypothesis and wind, ZEB1 is related to wind. So ZEB1 wind, it is acting and you know, leading to progression of uh, retinoblastoma. The most important thing and the most important exciting slide for me in this presentation is this one. Now, if we know that EMT is happening and we know the pathway, there are drugs which can work on that. So if you see the target genes and everything is there. So what happens is why we chose to look on EMT is we can repurpose existing drugs to work on it. We don't have, it's not easy to develop a new drug, but it is easy to find a drug to work. Example would be Avastin. It was for colon carcinoma, and now it's probably more used in retina than anything else. So all these drugs are potential targets, and there's a long list much more than this slide, which work in certain different parts of EM, uh, EMT pathway through Wnt and Zeb1, which we can repurpose. And that is our intention. So in conclusion, what we know till now is that EMT pathway is associated with tumor metastasis and drug resistance in other cancers. In our study, we demonstrated for the first time that it is involved in retinoblastoma tumor genesis. And RB1 related EMT repression can, if we stop it, will halt metastatic propensity and therapeutic resistance. So if a tumor is not, is tumor resistant and if you can have an additional drug, it will solve that problem. It will also give us a new intervention target because we are not targeting EMT pathway through any of the current chemotherapeutic modality. And most excitingly, we can repurpose some drug. If that happens over some time, that will be a real, real positive outcome of this. And once we are looking for EMT, we also know that there is a ZEB transcription factor and wind signaling pathway also at play, which is coming for this EMT. It can work through different signaling pathways. So these are the two pathways where we would like to work further. Thank you for your kind attention. Any questions if anyone would like to ask? Very nice, Dr. Gagan. Uh, just for one, just for my information, yes. like you need to have a tissue diagnosis to confirm this. Yeah, with that uh, gene expression, micro is a tissue diagnosis. We started from tissue. All right. Uh, so what I mean to say is that in future also, if uh, this needs a therapeutic translation, yes. then you need to have biopsy for that. Right? No, no uh, Okay, so the future way, what I understand, and I may not be entirely accurate, is now you have to identify a marker, like a drug from those. Now that drug, you do a trial on the cell line. Once you do on cell line, you are looking at dose and toxicity. Then after that, you do it on a rabbit. So once you have a dose and you know toxicity on the rabbit, then only you come to the stage where we can you know go further. So it's a long journey that. Yeah, way. but not all patients of retinoblastoma will yes. have this, no. Yes, not all will have. Not and other all thing will is have. So if 
half of them have and half they do not have it then just to confirm it you will ne- definitely need a no, tissue no, no, diagnosis no 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 we have a separate arm for that okay. actually you can diagnose it in tears also okay, okay. so that uh, is also there other thing is uh, what important thing would be there will be that it will uh, the pathway what we are having these drugs you can also check whether they are working synergistically with current drugs or not like we combined cyclosporine earlier mm. so what can happen is that in order to not to change no one has that much patient and we can't take biopsy with all those limitation rb what you can do is many of these drugs like uh, you know we have so they will work synergistically with the current drugs so like we uh, can add melphalan to current regimen so what will happen is with current regimen you can try something additive and then see without biopsy because our diagnosis is confirmed and specific markers or specific target like when to use when not to use that can be done through tear analysis so that also probably data i'll be sharing with you but might take another year or so for tear analysis yeah i think this may so go long yeah. IAS, ais paper but yes i have that data but it needs to be serially followed or validated and also in person if you want i'll share with you but not in no, public real program. good research actually in india we lack this kind of research so my congratulations Thank to you. you for such a wonderful job mm-hmm. yeah. All right, so we have had a very nice session and we are not supposed to declare the results here. Results would be intimated to you from scientific committee only and the winner will go to the final round. So once again, thanks a lot for a great session and uh, all presenters, they they deserve kudos for coming here and presenting with nice uh, studies. Yeah, I would again want to appeal and invite you all for the midterm uh, oculoplasty conference that I am hosting at Aurangabad on 3rd of July. So uh, please do register. There are special discounts uh, for registration during AIOC here at Mumbai. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all of you. First time maximum number of absentees I think any, yeah, in any session. <laughs> Usually there are no absentees in this. Yeah.